Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our Retail Profit AMA series. My name is Riley Stevens. I'm the Director of Insights here at Retail Profit, and I will also be your moderator for today's chat. As always, a few, housekeep a few housekeeping items before we get into our introductions. So we've allocated an hour for today's discussion. We'll be stopping at 12 p.m. Eastern time. We've disabled the chat box. So if you have a question for Ian or for Doug, please uh, submit it through the Q&A box, which is located at the bottom of your screen. We also will not be responding to any raised hands. So just keep that in mind over the next hour. We encourage you to share all of your thoughts with us on social media. We likely will not be able to get to everyone's questions today, although I wish we could. But if you do have questions, you can use the hashtag on Twitter or on Instagram or LinkedIn, and we'll be checking this after as a follow up. Now for introductions. Doug Stevens is the founder and CEO of Retail Profit, and he is currently in the midst of writing his third and highly anticipated book, Resurrecting Retail, The Future of Business in a Post-Pandemic World. This book is coming early spring of 2021. Now I would love to throw to Doug to introduce our very, very, very special guest today. Hey, thanks very much, Riley. And, and thanks everyone for joining us. It's great to have you here. This is a real treat, um, as much for, for me and Riley as it is for you. Um, I, uh, it, well, let's, let's back up a little bit. Uh, in 2015, Ian Rogers joined LVMH as their chief digital officer. And I believe Ian and I met in 2016 when someone on his team reached out and said, hey, we have a new digital officer with the company. We're putting together an event. We'd like to talk about how we can put together an information sharing session and uh, to which I agreed. And I began looking into this person, this new chief digital officer. It's at this point that my mind was kind of blown. Um, so Ian Rogers uh, actually uh, in the 90s um, started a tribute site, one of the first music sites on the web for the Beastie Boys. Uh, which caught the attention of the Beastie Boys, and they made him their webmaster. Uh, he, he then started a, a career on the digital side of the music industry. He helped uh, sort of foster the, the advent of MP3 technology into the mainstream. He was selling albums online uh, before there was such a thing as iTunes. He started two startups, sold one to AOL, one to Yahoo, became the VP and general manager of Beats Music, and had his first child when he was 17 to boot. So I was absolutely uh, dumbfounded and, and wanted to meet this guy. And I have to say, honestly, in, in the years since then that I've known Ian and in all the conversations we've had, they've not only been uh, inspiring, they've been fascinating. And, and I think you'll really be fascinated to meet him today. So Ian, thanks so much for being oh, uh, with thank us you today. For the kind words. I mean, really, I, I feel the same. I mean, having you come in and speak to us at, uh, at, at LVMH, it was, you know, we had the breakfast before with, with some of the CEOs and then, uh, and then a, a bigger event. And, you know, I, I, I gave your book to many people throughout the organization because I think, you know, you're, you, you're doing a great job of like taking something which, you know, is, is somewhat, you know, clickbaity, right? The, the kind of the retail apocalypse is, is very, is kind of like easy to, it's, it's an easy one to throw out there. Um, but, you know, you've made it something that's very like approachable and actionable and, and real. And so it's, it's super, been super helpful. Uh, it's, it's, it's a great relationship. And, and thank you very much for uh, the kind of words. I've been super, very lucky in, in, in life. And, uh, you know, as we talked about before, I feel lucky to still uh, be passionate about, about these kinds of things. You know, music is, pretty easy for me to be passionate about, but you know, I, I, it's, um, it's fun to still be passionate about disruption and technology and, you know, the, the way that the internet is changing humanity. And uh, I mean, that's kind of the bigger picture of, of, of what we're talking about, you know, and we're, I don't, I don't know about you, but I'm not here because of retail. I'm here because I'm a human being. Uh, I've been interested in technology since I was a kid. Somewhere along the way, I recognized that technology is changing humanity. And then just, you know, when you start pulling on the thread of, you know, that straight line between the printing press and TikTok, I mean, it's a lot of thread. And I, yeah. I feel like that's, you know, that's kind of what we're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Especially in a time like the one we find ourselves in right now. You know, it's so interesting. Like, you know, it's you, 
I think on some level, you know, so many of the things that we're experiencing um, in terms of the, the impact of the internet were somewhat predictable, right? I mean, if you go back to 2000, there were people who were in some ways, you know, predicting Trump and predicting Brexit by saying that, you know, we, you know, the, the, in, the, in the era of the internet, we are no longer going to be middle of the road. We are going to move, you know, from mass market to niche. And that means, um, you know, in the brands that we love, but it also means in politics and, and all kinds of other things. I think the thing that you couldn't have anticipated was just, you know, throwing a pandemic, you know, into that mix, like right at, right at the apex. You know, that, that was, you know, uh, you know, the, the internet has certainly, um, I mean, it's made our pandemic experience completely different than it would have been without it. Um, you know, so I think so many of the, the, the physics behind, you know, what we're living through because of the internet were predictable, but the pandemic is something that, that was, you know, even if, even if people knew it could come, nobody, certainly nobody knew it was coming now. Yeah, and I and I think you know there, you hear the, we hear the the term today. Oh, it's 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 the great acceleration. It's just everything that would have happened is now happening, but it's happening faster and more absolutely. And I think the point you just made is really important. I, I don't buy into that 100. percent Yeah, I think certain things, certain trajectories would be accelerated, but I believe that this pandemic is also going to potentially bring a whole bunch of stuff that no one anticipated. You know. Um, it's like every day there's something that that just seems uh, a asynchronous to what's going on right now. So, um, yeah, uh, I don't no, think I, we I, can I, just I, sum it up with a bumper sticker, the great acceleration, you know? Yeah, yeah. no, I completely agree with you. And I, and I think that that also it's just, it's forced us, you know, to, to kind of reckon with so many things in a way that, that we had earlier, such as technology, right? It's impossible to overstate, you know, how many people became more familiar with the, technology they already had in their pocket, you know, in, in the first part of this year. So yeah, you could call that an acceleration, but you know, it, it's, it's a, it's a fundamental shift when you, when you bring the future closer, faster, yeah. you change the present, you know, like, like there's, there's no, there's no two ways around that. So that, yeah, that's, that's, that's definitely right. What happened. That's right. Uh, Riley, I know that we got some questions in advance of this session. We were already almost immediately, as soon as we posted it, we started to get some questions. Um, do we have- Let's answer the I, hardest ones. Let's just go with the hardest questions. That's, that's no, right. No, 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 no. And our first question actually actually fits into what we were discussing perfectly. Our first question comes from San, Sandra and she asks, is the pandemic the once in a century catalyst for Amazon becoming a luxury retailer? You know, mm. to be honest, I don't think so. Um, I, I think that that you have to you have to break down kind of um, you know what is luxury um, and what do we want Amazon for because we you know I, I love Amazon I'm an Amazon Prime member I think I'm an Amazon Prime member in France and in the U.S. right so I, I, I um, you know I'm definitely an Amazon customer I have no uh, but I don't I don't buy things that represent my individuality necessarily with Amazon right I think that you know. Um, you know, we we uh, what we're what we're doing when we're buying luxury is we are we're identifying with with a tribe. You know, I think in that way, buying luxury is is um, you know it's not so different from you know when when I was a kid and I wore a Thrasher T-shirt or a Misfits T-shirt or you know I'm, I'm saying I'm part of that group. I'm not part of of that of that group, and I'm doing it with with fashion and self-expression. And I think that anyone who's in kind of the self-expression business or the, uh, you know, um, we help you identify business. I don't know what we, what we should call that, you know, has done ex extremely well in the, in the era of, of Instagram, you know, whether that's, you know, luxury handbags or makeup or tattoos or, you know, anything that's in kind of that, that, that self-expression um, side of things. So, I, and I think that, you know, there's a big difference between, you know, Hey Alexa, get me some batteries. Um, and I, I hesitate to say that because she's probably doing that right now. Um, but, yeah. um, the, the, uh, you know, and, and, you know, I, I want, um, you know, <laughs> she's a, the girl is unplugging it right now. Thank you. She's the, Alexa um, that's my jacked, that's um, my jacked the podcast. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, I, hopefully for everyone at home too. Uh, now that it's unplugged, I can say, "Hey Alexa, play some Slayer." I hope that is <laughs> happening in, in your in your uh, in your house right now. Um, the uh, you know, but I, I think there's a difference between that kind of commodity of you know, get me some batteries versus 
you know, what, what is it that I want to, you know, wear to the, the you know, that, that, that birthday party or, uh, you know, that, that it's just a completely different um, consideration process. So I, I don't, I don't think that, that, that Amazon really has any um, special advantage there. I think that, that, you know, if you think about, you know, going to Celine.com and using Apple pay, um, I, you know, as a consumer, I, I have, you know, trust of Apple Pay. I have trust of Celine. Celine has, you know, extraordinary um, customer service. You know, I can, um, the, 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 the customer service online is paired with customer service in a store. You know, there's, there's actually, uh, you know, I would say a lot of advantages to, um, to buying from a luxury brand versus uh, buying from Amazon. So I, I don't think that the, that the pandemic really gives them a, they, uh, a, an advantage in, um, in the luxury space at all. I, I'm interested, um, and we were talking a little bit about this before we jumped on the air, but I'm interested to see that, you know, Amazon just made an announcement a couple of days ago that it is going to forge ahead with a luxury marketplace. Apparently, they have a few partners lined up. But what's interesting to me is that, it, you know, whereas Amazon was always regarded as sort of the trailblazer in the, in the online commerce space for a long time, it seems like they have now turned to Alibaba. And they've sort of seen the success that, that Alibaba has had uh, with, with Tmall and with the luxury portion of Tmall in, in particular. They definitely want a piece of that. So they're, they're now sort of forging a marketplace somewhat in that image, allowing brands to build their own presence, being more sharing with data, being less predatory apparently on product knockoffs and that sort of thing. But I, I think you, you raise a really interesting point, Ian, and that is that I don't think Amazon's a good storyteller. I think they tell a very good story about their own business mm -hmm. and about the rise of their business and all the reasons that people should invest in Amazon, but they've never been good at telling stories about other people's products or brands. And, and to your point, I think when you buy luxury, you're buying a story that, that you feel you're a part of somehow culturally, right? Um, and, and, and so it's not about the structure of their site so much as it is about their ability to entertain and regale people with stories. And I think Alibaba is just fundamentally better at that. Seems well, think, to me anyway. I think that they're more, Alibaba is more open to it. Let me, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a, a, a slightly, a slightly longer answer. So prerequisite for me is, is that, you know, in, in luxury and in, um, and, and in, I think a lot of things that we care deeply about that are high consideration, um, you know, we sell stories or culture as a prerequisite to selling the product, right? So in luxury, if you don't buy, you know, the story of the brand, the image of the brand, um, you know, what that brand means in culture, then you don't want to buy the product because you're not just buying something with utility. You're buying something that expresses something about you. So when I buy that handbag, if I buy a Dior handbag, I'm saying to the world, I'm the kind of person who buys a Dior handbag. That's part of part of what you're buying. So in that way, the storytelling and the culture is actually part of the product. Right. Um, to, so I, I completely agree with your point. So you have to you have to lay that down as a as a as a fundamental. And I think if you if you notice the brands that are doing well, they they are laying down a very thick storyline, um, and then they're layering product, you know, kind of um, you know on, on top of that as as part of it. In other words, there's kind of to me it's really natural because I come from the music business. It's the same thing that that, that you would do in the music business, right? You 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 re, you you tell a story, you release a single, you do an interview, you do a radio show, you play a live show, you do all of these things before you sell an album, right? People are when they're buying an album, they're not buying you know a, a digital file or a piece of a piece of shellac, right? There or a compact disc. They're 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 buying culture that just happens to be captured in a moment in time. In, 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 in that in that disc, right? But it's also, you know, like culture is changing and ongoing. There's, you know, there, there were many periods of the Stones and the Beatles and, you know, name any, name any other or even contemporary artists, right? So I think, I think that, that you, have, you, have to keep, you, have to, you have to keep that in mind. I, I think then to your point about, uh, about Amazon, the way I look at, that, at this ecosystem is there's discover, find, and buy. And I think that really the brilliance of Amazon and the more I, the more deeply I think about it, the more in awe I am of what they had the vision to build when they built it. Because I think they understood discover, find, buy in the 90s when it was very unclear that that was how it would play out. But I think that they bet exactly right. And that's why in the 90s, they didn't tell stories. They built an affiliate program. 
right? And it's also why Amazon fundamentally doesn't care how you get the product. You know, they, they might buy it wholesale and sell it to you retail. They might, it might be a marketplace. It might be shipped from someone's kitchen table. They allow, you know, fulfill by Amazon, fulfill from your kitchen table and, and, you know, and everything else. And they have probably the most sophisticated, you know, wholesale and retail you know, buying and selling network on the planet at the same time, right? But, they, and they also, by the way, oh, you don't want to sell through us at all? Buy an ad, right? Right? They actually truly couldn't care any less, you know, how you get the product as long as they sit in the middle of that fine layer. So another piece that I believe fundamentally is that, that discover and buy will be, will be completely fragmented. In other words, you know, when I buy luxury, I'm going to learn a little bit from Instagram, a little bit from a friend, a little bit from Vogue, a little bit from what's new in the Porte, blah, blah, blah. And then ultimately, I'm going to turn to somebody in the middle, a Google and Alibaba and, and find List, which is a company that we're invested in and I sit on the board of. And then a customer is going to be very comfortable going to Louis Vuitton.com or Celine.com or Fenty Beauty.com, you know, et, et cetera, et cetera, to um, you know, to buy and that fragmentation and actually LVMH will benefit from the fragmentation, the buy, um, you know, in, in the buy category. So now they come all the way back around um, to your, to your comment about, about Alibaba. What I've found really surprising um, because I, I didn't know anything about Alibaba, you know, six years ago before I joined LVMH and I've really enjoyed, and I think, you know, we've been somewhat influential in, in their creation of, of Tmall Luxury Pavilion. And what I found was really refreshing is they actually like our business. They, they didn't want to take the oxygen away from us, which is what I experienced in the music business and what I feel a bit of the kind of like your margin is my opportunity mentality of, of, of Amazon. Um, and, I, and I think that, you know, what, what is amazing about the way Alibaba has produced, approached it is that they've said, yeah, we understand that what you do is, is very unique and how can we fit into that? So our, our, I'll finish with this. I'm sorry for the long answer. I hope it's interesting. But the, the, um, you know, when 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 we were talking to Tmall, it's been several years ago now. Before Tmall Luxury Pavilion, I said, "Listen, we love Tmall. If a shopping mall moved in across the street, where their only business was concession, they only charged five percent, and they had hundreds of millions of daily visitors, we would want to be there. Like that's our right. business. We're in shopping malls. We we like that." So, okay, so what is it we don't like uh, about Tmall? Let's be specific and see if we can solve those problems. First of all, you can't put luxury next to value, right? When we go into a shopping mall, you don't put the Vuitton next to the dollar store. There, there's, there's a reason that Steve Jobs followed, you know, Ben Arano in terms of uh, expansion with the Apple store, right? Because placement matters. Your positioning, who you're next to matters. Okay, so that's step one. Um, so putting, you know, Dior next to Q-tips, that's a non-starter, right? Secondly, storytelling matters to come all the way back around to your point, right? And, um, you know, we had this conversation with, with Alibaba, uh, you know, directly with, with Daniel Zhang, and there were some very senior people at, at, um, at LVMH who were in that meeting as well. And the very next morning, Daniel Zhang came up to me at Viva Technology here in Paris, and, and he said, uh, value versus value plus, right? And I said, yes, which was a direct quote from our friend Scott Galloway. And uh, I said, that's exactly right. He went, okay, less than six months later, they had the Tmall Luxury Pavilion. That, that's like a level of, that's a lack of arrogance. That's just listening and going, what does it take for a business like yours to be successful on my platform? I don't want to suck the oxygen out of the room. I want to, I'm happy to have a small piece of a very large pie. So I, I, I completely agree with you. I think it's been extremely impressive how Alibaba has handled this. It's, it's interesting. And just, just one final comment on, on that, and then we'll go to our next uh, question. But, but um, you know, the, the term ecosystems gets used a lot. And, and frankly, it, it wasn't a term that got used a lot in digital commerce prior to Alibaba's rise. They've sort of, you know, commercialized this idea of building ecosystems and habitats for consumers to exist in. And one of the fundamental aspects of any ecosystem is that every living thing within the ecosystem prospers equally um, and, and, and is sort of coexistent, you know, as opposed to dominated within a system, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. that's another fundamental difference. I just think that Jeff Bezos just has sort of an empire view of what Amazon is. That may change, um, but I think that that has been his view. And I think Jack Ma had much more of, an, of a, a, a sustainable ecosystem view. 
I, I wonder where that comes from in a way, because I feel like Amazon, you know, that discover, find, buy, I feel like there's a lot of clarity somewhere that we want to own find because there's a lot of things they did let go of. I think, you know, all the criticisms that everyone's lobbed at, at Amazon over the years about like, it's a terrible discovery experience, et cetera. I feel like they've been laughing the whole time because they've been saying, look, that's not what we're building. We're building the find part. We're not exactly. building discover. Ever, the internet is discover guys, come on, you know? So, and I feel like, you know, look, they've said, we're gonna solve the really, really, really hard problems of payments and fraud and logistics. And I, so I, I feel like there's really something within another place. I think there's also just a, a cultural difference. I'll tell you that one of the biggest things um, for us with, with Tmall, to your point about, about an ecosystem is, with Tmall, we can actually connect directly with the customer all the way to getting the customer's cell phone information. And that's not really a privacy violation, which is where, some, where your mind might go immediately. The customer has to opt into that, right? right? In, in the Tmall ecosystem. But double digit percentages of them do opt in to have a relationship with our brands. All the way, again, we get the mobile number, we can talk to them on WeChat. So I would say that if, if, if Amazon, I, look, let, let's break it down into the component pieces. Because remember, it's just software, right? It's only typing. This could all change tomorrow. Amazon and Farfetch could change tomorrow, software, right? So I would say that you've got a huge audience. That's great. You've got a relatively low revenue share. That, that, that works. You know, the revenue share works for business. Um, you know, I think if, if you had kind of a separation between value and value plus, which is very possible, Tmall has done it, Farfetch kind of is it, right? Um, you have storytelling. All right. Well, you know, I mean, Amazon actually offers a little bit of that. You can have brand pages and things like that. I wouldn't say it's, you know, but put it this way, it's fairly easily, you know, I mean, if, if, if Alibaba built it in a couple of months, I assume, you know, Amazon could do the same, right? Again, it's only typing. Um, and, and, you know, I think the missing piece is being able, is, is, that, is that disconnection from your consumer, right? And the yeah. consumers want a connection with our brands, right? That's they right. don't. They're, they don't value the middleman. They, 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 want, they want to be as close to Virgil Abloh as they can get, right? Yeah. Um, so that, that, that's the, the, I think that's the, that's the missing piece. And, you know, the, the final thing that Alibaba has, I mean, if you look at their, when they talk about Alimama, you know, their, their marketing platform, which is where the end game really is for them, right? You know, they don't, they're not super worried about our rev share, right? They want, they want the kind of the marketing dollars that, that, that drive the sales. Um, they, you know, that, that is, that's an incredible ecosystem. But I, I actually think that that's the story that people don't talk enough about is the, the rent that you are going to pay on the marketing side to drive those sales to Google and Alibaba. That is, that's actually, I would say, a bigger threat to the future luxury e-commerce ecosystem than is, than is Amazon. And, and you're thinking that will become unsustainable at a certain point? Is that what you mean? It's just going to become more uh, I think it's it's already, escalating cost of, already, of customer acquisition? Yeah, it's already too expensive, both in yeah. the case of Google and Alibaba. Yeah. You know, the yeah. load or the rent. I mean, and just compare it to rent, right? If you just compare it on a percentage basis to rent, it's already too much. Yeah. But I think agreed. that that's that hopefully what we, what we can hope for that is that there will be a marketplace. That's, that's again, you know, why we have an interest in things like List. Because if List is a fashion-specific search engine, which is good for fashion customers and um, can do the role of, say, Google Shopping for the serious fashion customer, and the rent is the rent, if you will, if you if you if you if you don't mind me using that word, is you know is is half of what it is on you know Google Shopping or yeah. Alibaba, then then that's good for the whole industry, and it also creates a market dynamic that makes the the prices make sense, right? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, well, I think that's all the time we have. Thanks for tuning yeah, well, in, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> sorry. Hey, get Ian and I going here. We could go. Yeah, we could just yeah. go all day. Um, this Riley, is fantastic. And just quickly before we pivot, because I, I, we've talked a lot about the digital world so far, obviously, given Ian your background and your your day to day work. But you know, you touched on something really interesting, and I was just reading a really interesting article a couple of days ago, um, written by the chief strategy officer at Alibaba. Now, this article was written six years ago, and and basically they say that the the whole fundamental fundamental idea behind their strategy is to do exactly what you discussed, which is find ways to support the businesses and the customers that use their platform. The interesting thing is they see those two things as being equally important and they recognize that the brands that they have like LVMH on their platform provide that value to their customers. So you can start yeah. to see how fundamentally Alibaba is set up differently from a st strategic standpoint to provide more value to their, to their sellers and to their customers 
and as a result, probably why you've had the experience that you've had. And I don't think at the same time, there, it's a, it's a market, right? I mean, Alibaba is going factory direct to, to consumers, and that's threatening to a lot of businesses. You know, and that's I would say similar to the fact that Amazon. You know, I don't know. I mean, I, I just I only know what I've read, which is that you know when they when they reach kind of twenty percent of any category, they enter the category, right? To come yeah. back to batteries, you know, as as an example, the kind of Amazon Basics model. I don't know if, um, if Alibaba is completely exempt from that, right? When they're doing kind of factory direct deals, they're definitely disrupting people. But I also think that's why luxury is a, is a, great, is a, is a great industry, right? Because, you know, there's the Louis, Louis Vuitton has a monopoly on Louis Vuitton. Right. Now, Ian, we talked about this idea of um, sort of the three categories, discover, find, buy, and the experiences that are happening within each of those buckets. Do you think that luxury can survive a low touch retail world where physical retail stores are restricted. Do those experiences just simply be, become transferred online or what does that look like and how does that impact luxury? It's a, it's a great question. I think that um, I, 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 I love it. I love, I love kind of imagining it because I think there's kind of um, multiple versions of it. You know, I think that if you go back eight years, Ben Arano said brick and mortar is still king. Right. And, um, and, and I think that, he was right. And it was right because of what you're, the question you're asking, those experiences are simply superior to, oh my God, I'm online. Like the page looks weird. There's a million forms to fill out. Like, I don't know if it's coming. I don't know if I'm going to be home when the package comes, you know, I, all, all of that kind of, you know, poor experience, like, which can't really compare to welcome to Dior. Would you like a glass of champagne? And you know, isn't your wedding anniversary in two weeks? And can I show you, you know what I mean? Like there's a level of, of service in luxury, which is just, you know, really outstripped the experience online. And I think that luxury was a thousand percent right not to commoditize their products within a lesser service before. I think that what happened in the meantime, though, is that as customers, well, first of all, the experience improved. I mean, you know, the what, what we see on our iPhone is very different than what we saw on the web in 1999. Um, and we, we started to kind of change our, our idea of luxury, right? I mean, I think things like Uber and Airbnb you know, they, they almost like uh, made luxury accessible. I don't, I don't have a private driver, but I have Uber. I don't have a vacation home, but I have Airbnb. You know, you started, you know, Warby Parker gave you this like this experience, which was so much better than what you would get at the ophthalmologist, you know, online. And it was kind of this like light bulb of, wait a minute, there's a new kind of luxury experience here that you can deliver online. So I think that, that brands have gotten much better at that. I mean, I'll just tell you, you know, when I, when I buy something from one of our brands, I'm likely to do it over WhatsApp with a sales associate who I know who, you know, it's the way I talk to my friends, right? You know, I mean, the way I talk to my daughter or, or you know, my best friends is on WhatsApp and the way I, you know, buy that handbag for my girlfriend for Christmas at Loewe is also, you know, via WhatsApp. In a, in a way. So is that, I think that's the problem is that people get tripped up thinking that e-commerce looks like Amazon, right? Whereas, you know, really what you're talking about is, is, you know, a great experience for people who are potentially more time poor than, than money poor uh, on a relative basis when they're buying these products, they want like, they want personalized service. They want something special. They want it exactly when they want it and how they want it. And, and there's no question that the internet will be a tool in, in doing that. You know, will that look like a bunch of, you know, very expensive dresses in a grid, you know, like add to cart, check out PayPal, maybe not. Um, but, it, but it will definitely involve uh, your mobile phone, you know, somewhere, somewhere along the way. So I think it's just a new, a new kind of luxury. And I think it's about being, you know, um, uh, really respectful of people's time. I think an interesting thing here too is that, you know, we 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 we're in a period of time now where there, for obvious reasons, there are restrictions on physical retail, and so, as an industry, we're sort of bemoaning that fact, and and um, many, I'm sure, in the industry are just you know waiting with bated breath to the point where they can fully reopen without any sort of uh, mitigation or or restriction. The interesting thing is I think the longer we go through this, I think it's going to, in many ways, force the industry to confront its own demons, you know, it, because how much of that, oh, luxury can't be sold online, oh, luxury is high touch, I need to see it, feel it, et cetera. How much of that is just like mythology? 
that's been sort of baked into the equation and been a crutch for many luxury players, not just luxury players, retail players in general, to just yeah. sort of say, oh, sure, we can, you know, people can buy online, but they can't really shop, they can't discover, they can't enjoy. And, you know, we've been talking to people like Nia Singh, for example, the founder of Obsess, who is sort of completely reimagining what an online experience could be. Let's get rid of the grid pattern of, of web design. Let's create these environments that are super cool that consumers can move through. Alibaba is doing cool stuff with uh, live streaming directly to individual high net worth customers. Um, you know, what's happening in stores is becoming media now that's being projected out to audiences around the world. Um, so in, in some way, I feel like we could come to the point where everyone says, okay, everyone, you know, COVID's, COVID's at bay now, feel free to reopen. And everyone's going to turn around and say, hmm, you know what, we don't really need stores the way we the way we did in 2020. Uh, it could sort of be the big reveal that we, uh, I mean, look, we you, bridged you've the gap. Been, you've been saying this, I mean, for, for years, you know, the, the, you know, certainly the etymology of the word store as storage is, is you know, is, is, is behind us. I think that, you know, luxury stores do offer, you know, an experience, right? So when you go into the Fendi store in Rome, where there is a view into the atelier in the store, you know what I mean. That that is much more experiential than than simply than than simply um, you know browsing. Um, right. You know, at, at the same time, I, I couldn't agree more that that um, you know I, I think most of what we have been doing at LVMH is really on the supply side of the equation this year. You know, so since the shutdown, you know, we've been really doing the basics. I would say that in in many ways. Um, you know, many of the brands at, at, at LVMH, I think if you take, you know, Louis Vuitton and Sephora have been very aggressive, Fen you know, other, you know, Fendi and many others have been very aggressive with e-commerce over the last, you know, five or, five or so years. Still, I think that there's a lot of kind of treating it as the, the current 5% of revenue as opposed to the future 30% of revenue. And that's what's changed during this time. And I think what happens when you open up the supply side it's exactly what you said is that, you know, you do start to, you start to build services and interactions, which are superior and people don't want right. to go back to them. I don't, right. I don't think that's, you know, just luxury. I mean, how many of us have had a terrible problem with a big box retailer where you go in there to buy a camera or a washing machine or whatever. And you just have this thought of like, I understand why people hate physical <laughs> retail. Like, you know, you, you know, you're like, how could you make me go through this? Right. You're, you're basically like the person walks over to the computer and fills out the same form you could have, you know, filled out your, yourself at home, you know, that, that experience. At the same time, during the pandemic, I had an experience with FNAC here in Paris where I wanted to, you know, to, to buy a board game for, you know, my family to play. And it was an amazing transfer from one store to another, click and collect, like couldn't have been easier. And it's one, you know, once you've done it, you don't go back. You know, I, I'm I'll, now I'm like, oh, well, I'll, I will try Fnac before I try Amazon for that particular category, yeah. because that was such an amazing experience. You got me something obscure very quickly. Very, you know, I just walked in, I picked up, it was clean. You know, so I think that that's the thing is when you open up, I think what the, the, maybe the salient point there is that supply is not just product, it's also services. Yeah. And when you open up the supply side, like for example, we know that in, in London, you know, for Marks and Spencer and John Lewis, more than half of their online orders are collected in store. And then you talk to people in Tokyo and they will say, well, no one here does click and collect. And I will say, no one there offers click and collect, right? Um, you know, it's like saying no one in Paris lives in tall buildings, right? And, you know, it, it, if, you, if, those, if those Tokyo retailers started offering click and collect, you have a population of people where there's a super high penetration in 4G, very high propensity to buy online, you know, et cetera. You, if you make those services available, they will adopt them and they won't go back to them. So I think that to your point from earlier, this is one of the things that won't change. People are, are, are opening the supply side, both products and services. Customers will inevitably adopt those services because they're, they're, because they're pleasant to use. And then you, you won't go backwards from there. Well, history proves you right. Um, you know, if you look at China's evolution, uh, prior to SARS, if I'm not mistaken, e-commerce in China was actually, as a percentage of retail, was below the U.S. Right. And then when they emerged from SARS two years later, it was higher than the, than the U.S. Uh, uh, proportion. So it literally transformed their, their online uh, economy. Absolutely. Yeah. What's up there, Ryan? What's next? 
So next, I want to ask about um, generational differences. So Ian, from your perspective, we know that Western millennials and Gen Z have been slammed by the financial crisis that's unfolding now because of um, COVID. Previously, there was the economic crisis of 2008, 2009, which is now a double down on millennials that have gone through both of these downturns. I'm curious to know what your thoughts on are on what this means for luxury and will luxury now as a result lose a generation due to this financial crisis they've had to live through two times. Uh, it's a great question. I mean, it'll certainly be impacted, right? And as a, you know, again, I have a, I have a 30 year old and I have a 13, almost 14 year old. Um, and then and my, my girlfriend's daughter is six. Uh, that's like my secret weapon is just watching these generational, um, uh, changes and and kind of observing observing behavior. I, so I think that you know my, my feeling is again fun. What's the fundamentals under luxury are are extremely sound because again if if on some level what what luxury sells is identification with the tribe that's not going anywhere and it's accelerating and it, and you know we are all sharing our identities at an unprecedented clip. I actually I hope that subsides a little bit from well from where we are today. I feel like we've all kind of been through this experiment of living in public and and you know we've kind of lived through that era when we didn't know that cigarettes cause cancer um you know and and now we know that doesn't mean that everybody quit smoking but people don't smoke and you know think it's good for you anymore um and you know i think similarly we know that social media causes depression and you know and uh you know dictatorships on some level um and and you know so we, we will adjust our behavior but I think that that still, if you look at the the rate at which we're we're expressing ourselves, you know that 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 is um, you know it's just un, it's unprecedented. And I think that's fundamentally, you know, what is beneath luxury, right? When you are going to the airport, are you carrying, um, you know, to me away or Remova or Vuitton as your luggage? Like which you know it's like sneakers. Everybody has a pair. And the ones you have say something about you. That was Jimmy Iovine's premise at Beats. Wow, well, everybody's going to carry these phones. That means everyone's going to have headphones. And which ones you wear are going to say something about you. So I, I, I think that when it comes to handbags and um, you know and, and the clothes that we wear, you know that that that's not going to change any anytime soon. Where you know there you know you can go all the way. There's a you know if you're wearing a white T-shirt, there is a cultural difference whether that white T-shirt is from the Gap or from Uniqlo. We would love it to the fact, you know, if there were, if we weren't that animal, but we are that animal. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and so I don't, I don't think that, 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 that changes, but I think that, you know, what it is people desire will certainly change, but it always has, you know, I mean, it's, it's always gone, you know, there've always been trends. There've always been fads. There've always been, you know, we don't want logos. We want huge logos, you know, like that, that uh, we, we, we don't, you know, tie dye is for hippies. Oh, tie dye is everywhere. You know, I mean, that's, uh, you know, that, that, that's just called fashion. Um, so I, I don't, I, I think that, you know, uh, people will, will, will still buy things that express themselves. I would say that the disruption actually comes from the low end. I think the thing that we all have now is we have access to exactly what we want. And we, you know, that's from a culture perspective and a product perspective, you know, I, I might not want, you know, the, the, the thing that is the biggest or the loudest or the noisiest. I might want the thing that is, you know, the smallest and the coolest that my, you know, that, that only my friends know about, you know? So I think that, you know, it's more the low end disruptions in luxury um, that are, that are, that are the ones to watch than, than I, I don't, I don't think it's the, the case that, that um, I, I don't think people stop buying expensive things. I don't think people stop buying nice things. I think, in fact, it's the opposite. We move away from things that were driven to us from marketing and toward things that we believe are highly qualitative. And I think that that really works, you know, in luxury. If I'm, you know, if I'm buying something where which is, you know, built with craftsmanship, and you know, and and you know, stood behind with with guarantees and those sorts of things, that that has a, you know, that actually has a higher value to me than the thing that was just kind of. You know, shoved at me from a marketing perspective, or or I happened to walk by in the mall, right? So, um, and I think that's the case with luxury. Nobody bought luxury because it happened to be in the mall. You know, these are high consideration, high quality. Um, you know, you know, products that are that that with with kind of brands and relationships that were built over a very long time. And I think that that has actually more value in the future, not less. But I think that the trends in terms of what people want to consume. Uh, will certainly change, but it always does. 
within that idea, Ian, what I find interesting about this pandemic is that we, throughout this period, um, although you know I know supply chains were disrupted uh, initially and there were, there were some hiccups, for all intents and purposes, we have had access to product. You know, we've still been able to get things delivered, and there is some evidence among psychologists, anyway, that in fact there's sort of this counterintuitive relationship between crisis and luxury. That luxury can play a, a kind of a fundamental role in the rebuilding of of self esteem and and provide a sense of distraction from the threat of of a crisis. Um, but what I find interesting is the one thing that we really and truly have been deprived of our our experiences our our physical experiences you know even simple things like getting together with family have been somewhat restricted do, do you see a larger opportunity perhaps on the other side of the pandemic for luxury experiences as opposed to products will will that sort of open up a new realm of of a, a new a new category so to speak yeah, I mean, I think it was it was already there. I think I'm quoting you when I say, you know, as we all deal, we all live in a world with screens more and more that in person becomes, you know, more valuable, not less. I think I'm stealing that quote from you if I'm if I'm attributing it correctly, and I and I really believe that. So I think there's so yes, there's um there's both opportunities because people are going to want to come to store, right? There's a there is actually something fun and rewarding and and especially a luxury store, you know. A, about that, so when when they when they can, they will um, on 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 some level certainly, and then but then also I think um, you know that experience that that could you know it could include dining, it could include you know our our, our friend Kenzo Digital, who's based in New York, who built the Bacardi um, haunted house experience. Uh, you know that those kinds of things, which is a branded um, experience, but it's a haunted house kind of experience. It's not a store like experience. There's certainly, I think lots of opportunities for those kinds of things. The stranger things drive in is a brilliant, you know, of the moment, uh, idea. Um, you know, we, one of our CEOs said something to me that I just loved and I, I won't, I won't, I, I don't know if he would want to be quoted or not. I would love to give him credit if, uh, if he would be. So my apologies to him. Uh, but I also don't want to expose him if he doesn't want to be quoted. But he said, he put it, he put it greatly. He said, you know, I, I think what we need is, you know, probably not as much square footage in terms of physical stores. We need better tools in the hands of our sales associates, right? Um, and uh, we probably need more of those sales associates because people want a personal connection. So it might be in person and it might be at a distance, which is the same way we talk to each other, right? I, I see my 75 year old father whenever I can. And in between time we text, you know, I think our relationships with brands will, will be quite similar. Um, but he also, the CEO of ours also says, if we build a store, it better be out of this world, right? That, that like little corner with some bags on a shelf, that's what's over. The store is not over. That like, it's as you say, you know, storage, that's over. Store as experience is just, is just starting. It's, you know, really, really just starting. But also, you know, we need to have kind of broadcast capabilities in, in that store because not everybody can come to that store. How do, we, how do we invite people in, you know, that can't be there? I saw this in the music world where a music manager said to me 10 years ago, right? On every tour I do, two of my dates will be virtual. Right? Because even if I'm playing 15,000 person arenas every single night, I can't play to everybody in the world who wants to see my band. I can't get there. I can't get to the, you know, the furthest most parts of the world. I can't get to every part of America even. Right. Yeah. So you want to be able that that's the advantage that we have is we can have this like incredible, um, you know, temple like experience. And then we can also share that experience with people, whether it's live streaming or Instagram or, or you know, or WeChat, et cetera, right? So I think, I, I think yes and yes. It's, I find it super exciting. I think, you know, that when we talk about experience, Riley asked a question earlier about, about, um, about, about the experience side. And I think that it goes to, um, you know, that we, we've, we've gotten to the point where we have like the great kind of like the basics, click and collect and return to store and, uh, make an appointment and curbside pickup and you know those those kinds those are great services but that thing that looks like you know Louis Vuitton plus FaceTime you know that's still coming and and that that's going to be in incredible you know I mean I watched my 13 year old spend a couple hours a day in a virtual world with her friends called Fortnite right um, yeah. you know like shopping malls going away but I don't know 
I mean, Fortnite seems to be serving the purpose that the shopping mall served for me when I was 13. Um, you know, so, so that, yeah, I think that those, ex those experiences, but they'll be kind of offline, online, and to your point, more screens I mean in-person is more premium. Yes. And, and, and should be, yeah, you're right. And should be total added value, like something you literally could not experience any other way. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. If you could do it from your couch, you're going to do it from your couch. Uh, right. <laughs> now, I, I'm curious to know, we, we started to tease this out and we've talked a lot about what the future could look like, but I'm curious to know what would need to change or is there anything that needs to change about e-commerce right now to make it a better habitat for retail and consumers generally? That's a great question. Um, you know, I think we have all the tools I think that's why I say that, you know, for us, the work is still on the supply side and we still have, I think, you know, at, I, you know, at LVMH, I think we have a very um, clear vision of, of where we're going and, and hopefully you hear it in the, in the things that I've said, um, but we just have a lot of work to do. You know, I mean, we're, we, um, it's been a relatively small part of our business up to this point. And, you know, so the, the infrastructure um, that, that we need to do it well um, you know, we, we don't have all of it yet. We have pieces of it. We're, we're adding it, you know, in some places we've added it brand by brand. Um, but I think if you look at what Amazon does and why is Amazon, you know, a $1.5 you know, trillion dollar business or whatever it is uh, today, um, you know, I think it's because they've solved a lot of those hard problems. You know, they've, they've, they've really gone in and these, these like very difficult problems of building marketplaces and, and, you know, uh, dealing with fraud and, and dealing with logistics and, you know, making sure that the pricing is right and the product is available and it's available in all territories. And if somebody infringes your copyright, you can ask them to take it down. And, you know, all of these very difficult things, like these are, these are, you know, genuinely hard problems um, uh, that they've solved that, that, you know, our, our industry is, is just, you know, behind on in, in terms of getting there. But I think all the pieces are there, um, but we need, we need to come all the way up the curve in terms of you know, turning all of those software pieces into, um, into products for the consumer. And then I think the other really exciting thing is you know, what, what you can do with, with artificial intelligence and, and machine learning applied you know, to all the data that we have to offer personalized experiences and, um, you know, and just, just offer, you know, I mean, privacy and, and luxury are synonymous, but personalization and luxury are synonymous as well. So I think that that you know leveraging all of our data assets to build better customer experiences is, is a is a is a fairly unexplored um, you know frontier at this point um, that uh, you know that 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 will get a lot of investment over the next say five to ten years. Yeah, and I think too you know what we're what, I think the the opportunity let's put it that way the opportunity right now I think is to is to humanize the online experience you know um we, we we hear a lot of headlines obviously that you know that there's this dehumanization that it's going to be about robotic warehouses and drone delivery and you sort of get this image that you know it's just this uh people sitting by the neon light of computers you know doing nothing but ordering never going out of their houses there's sort of this dystopia that gets painted about the future of e-commerce. But I think counterintuitively, we're sort of sitting on an opportunity to humanize it, to, to ask ourselves the question, you know, um, how can we make this feel more like a physical experience? How can we um, have a, a interaction between two human beings, a customer and, a, and an expert, a product expert? How can we use the physical events that are happening in stores and, and be broadcasting those out to vastly larger audiences. You know, it's, um, it's a really, I think, uh, interesting prospect that, that we could wind up with a much, you know, to Riley's question, um, that we wind up coming out of this with two things, stores that are much better because there's no point in having a store unless it's awesome and online experiences now that start to feel and emulate more of what we appreciated about the physical world, you know? So we could come out sort of double right winners here. I love, I love the way you're saying that, Doug. I think I completely agree with you and I think it's a real positive and I think it's, I think it's very real. Again, come back not to my words, but the words of, of, of one of the you know, great CEOs of, of LVMH. He said, we need more people 
with better tools, right? Like he, and when he says people, he means sales associates. He means yeah. more people interfacing with customers. And, you know, when you build a store, it had better be an extravaganza. So I think that, I think you're right. That's exactly what happens is, you know, perhaps you have fewer stores, but maybe not. Maybe you just kind of have the ones we have today, more or less, right? Maybe, maybe you don't have the ones that are the corner, right? But you, you know, the ones that are, that are big and beautiful don't go anywhere, right? They, right. in fact, better. They, there's more capital expenditure that makes those stores even better in, in terms of from an experiential standpoint. And you actually have more human beings, you know, who are able to talk to customers. Because if you think about it, like, let's look at, you know, I mean, on a very, like, um, course way of, of defining the luxury audience, people who travel internationally or people who either live in major cities that have luxury stores or travel to big cities who have luxury stores. So there's some number, that number has fallen off a cliff in this year, right? Um, you know, and, but, but even before, just compare that number to the number of people with smartphones, right? In terms of an addressable audience. That's why you need more people. If I'm gonna try, if my, if my, you know, my customer base just became every human being with a smartphone, wow, how do I talk to those people? But to your point, it's not about like the robotic, again, a, a, like rows of dresses and like add to cart, PayPal. Yeah. That's well, not that's the find and buy. buy. That's, that's just find and buy, right? To your point, right? right. Exactly. I want something and, and, fast, well, fine. We have this other opportunity to your point now, which is like, you know, a Ublo watch. A Ublo watch could cost, you know, 10,000 euro, it could cost 20,000 euro, it could cost 150,000 euro, depending on, on, on the one that you, that, that you select. You follow you and you follow you blow on Instagram. Anybody can follow you blow on Instagram. You blow is advertised, you know, in, in football games, right? So it's very easy to go from watching football to following you blow on Instagram to, hey, how much is that? Boom, now I'm in a conversation with a sales associate, no matter where I am in the world, right? I didn't have to walk into a mall or, and, and, you know, and, and, I'm, and that could be a real human connection, which is what you would have if you went in the store. There'd be a real person there, you know? Um, and, and, and that is how you buy something of that value, right? It's not like add to cart, check out. That's not how you buy a $20,000 watch, right? So that, that I, I completely agree with you. And I think that's the part that maybe people don't, quite see around the corner yet, but I, I really like the way you painted that vision and I couldn't agree more. Uh, you mentioned watches. Um, I'm a bit of a watch hound. Um, and just as a side note, seeing as we're talking about luxury, yesterday Rolex announced a new line of, of watches, new line of uh, Rolex Submariners and a whole bunch of other watches sold out before they even hit the street. So yes, there's money out there. Yes, people are still buying luxury. And uh, there's one example of, of how it's going down. Well, and, and you know, you bring up another point that we didn't talk about yet, which is we we live in a you know, luxury is a very supply limited business, right? So we talk a lot about like the extraordinary customer experience, but let's be honest, if um, you know, if some very um, in demand product was only like, let's say that you know, Kanye's new shoe was only available at a at a um, warehouse in New Jersey, and you had to drive your car there to pick it up, and it was like the worst customer experience imaginable, he'd still sell every pair. Yeah, exactly. Right? So when you're in a supply limited situation, you know, you're, you're using kind of a, a different, a different set of tricks. Now that wouldn't necessarily give you affinity to the brand, which is, you know, not, not necessarily a good way to run a business. But my point is, is that there's, that there, we're not, we're, we're also, we're not in the business of, you know, of, of, you know, just like stamping and selling and stamping and selling, you know, or, or in, in the business of selling things that are, that are very unique and precious. How much of that is, is integral now to luxury? The whole, the whole speeding up of the cycle, you know, the, the, the whole fashion cycle, the trend cycle, having to have something new in front of consumers all the time. Um, how, how much of that is now just sort of table stakes for luxury brands, Ian, as opposed to sort of these big annual reveals of collections and that sort of thing? How much of it is just a day-to-day effort to produce great content and stories? You know, I, I feel like I'm probably not the best person on the planet to, to, to speak on it, but I'll give you my, my, my opinion, which is that um, I, I think that it really varies brand to brand, right? In, in terms of what, what the expectations are. But I think that, you know, for, you know, for luxury fashion, I mean, what you described with Rolex is actually, you know, a, a good example as well, where the, a lot of the motivation to purchase that particular um, piece was from the storytelling combined, you know, with the scarcity, 
right? So, I, so I think that that is uh, you know something that that will you know that that will always work for the people who you know who who are who are in the market, um, you know, for for those products. I, I buy a lot of vinyl, and I would buy less vinyl from the places I buy it if they weren't limited edition numbered pressings, right? Um, right. So it's 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 um so I think that that dynamic um you know definitely works. I, I think that you know really you know the the the, the challenge is is, that, is people trying to sort of make the transition you know in 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 the model um you know where they're where they're I think when you're in a pure direct to consumer world like Louis Vuitton is or Dior um where you know there's no wholesale you can you can really dictate your own um schedule. I think that 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 is it's a much easier it's much easier to figure out what exactly is right for your brand. Whereas if you're a brand who's very dependent on wholesale, now I, I think you're I think that's those are the ones that are yeah. really struggling right now to 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 to, to sort of because you have this you're at this moment where you know you have to do this kind of Indiana Jones like bag of sand and the amulet trick you know I remember when he did that you, you know and and that is a that's a really that's a really tough one to do in a in a desperate moment which is which is what we're in now so I think brands that are highly dependent on wholesale are in a very hard time moving to a new model whereas if you could already control your distribution you're going to dial in the model that's right for you right good point now one last question we've got four minutes and this might be a loaded question and kind of cruel of me to ask with four minutes to go, but Ian, you once said in an interview with Business of Fashion that code is craft. Explain to us in our audience what you mean by that and how it can inform the work of retailers in general. You know, what I, what I, what I meant by that in, a, in, in maybe the most tangible form is that, you know, the, the way that your product reaches consumers is, um, is important. It's as, it's as important as the product itself. And, you know, my, my point um, saying that once upon a time is, is that, you know, luxury has always cared so much about how their product reaches their customers. Yet, you know, online there, there was, you know, kind of less attention paid, um, you know, to how you might craft that, that beautiful experience. Right. So in other words, you know, you, I, I, st I still see it. I mean, when, when a brand makes a website, I'm shocked at how kind of 1999, you know, they generally feel where, you know, it's sort of like an information repository rather than a customer journey, right? When I, when I open the Uber app, it's a customer journey, right? It's a map. Where would you like to go? You know, it's, it's all, you know, it's, 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 but when I open a, a brand, you know, website, um, they, they, uh, you know, it's, it's like you figure it out, you know, there's a hamburger menu in the upper left and why don't you click on it and pick from the menu, you know, whereas really like they should know what I'm trying to do from a journey perspective and build it that way. That's the high level of what I meant. What I meant underneath of that though, is that there really is a difference between, you know, we, we all, we, you know, you, you, you know it, if you've done it right, you, you build a house differently if you are planning to live on it, live in it than if you're planning to sell it, right? And so we have an industry which has relied on kind of outsourced development. And, you know, it's, it's sort of like, you know, an entire, you know, all, all the technology we built is kind of equi equivalent to, you know, doing all of your, like getting everything you need to build your house at Home Depot, right? You know, you've, that we, we, you know on one hand, we're crafting our products with the finest materials and, you know, and, and hundreds of years of, you know, of craftsmanship that's been handed down for generations. And then you just go hire the, the cheapest, you know, who person to, to build your e-commerce site. And then, and then you wonder how many years later, why you're so far behind Amazon. It's like, well, guess what you, um, you know, you, if you, had thought about how this ecosystem works, you could have predicted that, you know, you, yeah. so I think that, you know, uh, the underneath of what I, of what I meant on, meant by that was, you know, you, you, you have to put the same uh, attention to detail into um, the technology that you use to build your customer experiences um, that you do uh, into, into the way you build your products. Um, and I think, you know, as we talked about earlier, the, the even, even more so when it comes to, to data and artificial intelligence, because, you know, whereas, you know, maybe building hardware or software is like 
building a house or even a skyscraper where you you have a blueprint and yeah it's maybe it's very it's it's maybe very complicated but it's not particularly complex if if that if that makes sense you know when you're looking at when you're trying to look at data to build um, business processes you know it's it's um, you know as as a, as someone just said on a podcast I just listened to, it's more akin to trying to understand the cosmos. It's like science; it requires experimentation. So I think that that um, a mistake that many people will make is, you know, just hiring an agency to do that for them, as opposed to actually learning how to do it. But you could apply that to all kinds of areas of your business. If you have an agency writing your Instagram captions, you're doing it wrong. Period. Exactly. There's no. Yeah. There's no two ways around it. And I think that the last thing I'll say is this was kind of exemplified in the business and it still is in many places by having technology is called IT and it reports to the CFO, which when, when technology was a cost of doing business that was meant to be minimized in terms of cost and risk, that made sense. You know, if you, if you have a part of your business that you want to like drive as close to zero as possible in terms of cost and risk, then have it report to your CFO. If it's a strategic driver of your business, it reports to the CEO. And that's where, and I think that that's one of the changes that we've you know, been trying to affect here is to have technology really have a seat at the executive committee of the table because it is a strategic driver of business. The same way that marketing and retail are strategic drivers of business. You don't have marketing report to finance. Imagine if marketing reported to finance, right? Um, you know, that, that doesn't make sense. You, you, so I think that's the, the other thing that was behind the question. So th th thanks for asking. Well, I'm, I'm just going to say, I know we're at 12 o'clock. Um, Ian, you just don't disappoint, man. Uh, every is what I do. That is disappointing. <laughs> I disappoint myself. I hope that. No, it's, it's, it's My fabulous. Everyone for talking so goddamn much. <laughs> we always, I, I always enjoy our conversation. So thanks again for being with us. Uh, Riley, I know that you want to uh, just tell people about the follow-up uh, and the video version of this chat. Yeah, I, I echo everything Doug just said. Ian, thank you so much. You're so smart and so creative, and it's so inspiring to hear you speak about everything you spoke about oh, today. Thank you. Really, for I appreciate everyone, it. For everyone who's, uh, who's still with us here, we're going to be uploading this to YouTube. We'll share the link out um, with all of you with, within this week. Um, otherwise, feel free to, again, share your thoughts on social media using the hashtag RetailProfitAMA, and we'll send out more information about our next session, which you won't want to miss either. Thank you so much, everyone, and thanks again, Ian, for joining us. Pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, day. everyone. Thanks, Ian. Take care. Bye, guys.